Well, hi, good morning. Thank you for coming and joining me in my shop here for another round with this. I think this is going to go pretty quick now. Um, at the end of the last video, the first video I posted on this, um, it may have been apparent I was quite confused looking at the uh, schematic and I couldn't sort things out. And uh, since then, since I posted that video, I've spent quite a bit of time staring at the schematic and I think it's all come clear to me now. So we're going to start by looking at the schematic and I'm going to explain what I've come to conclude about it and then it's going to help me uh, figure out if I can increase the sensitivity somehow uh, on the scope so lower power signals like QRP signals will fill the scope screen over here instead of what they're doing now. So let's take a look at the schematic. We'll run through it here. Okay, so I've got the entire schematic to start with. It's a little hard to look at, but let me just break it down here a little bit uh, before we get going, um, before we look more closely. So this is the vertical amplifier circuitry right in here. These are the outputs, which go to these inputs right here and right here, which are driving the deflector plates. See these coils here? I'm going to talk about those a little more in a bit. The horizontal amplifier is uh, virtually identical. It's located here. Both of these amplifiers have inputs uh, on the back, phono, phonotype inputs on the back of the, uh, of the cabinet. Here's the horizontal input. Here's the vertical input. The intention of the scope is to allow someone to look at audio type signals so the scope is more versatile in operation and you would put those audio or low frequency signals into these inputs here. The regular high frequency or RF antenna type input is coming into these two here or one of these two. This is just a pass through uh, arrangement on the back. Now if we look at the RF signal, um, where does it go? It comes in, goes through this um, attenuator circuit, and then pretty much straight out of these two terminals I'll show you in a moment. There's a very important coil here, which we need to talk about, which we will. These go straight to the deflector plates, right here. They're connected right here on the defector, deflector plates. There's no time where the RF signal is sent down through the vertical amplifier. The vertical amplifier is reserved for audio or low frequency work. It's not intended for RF at all. This circuitry is the sweep generating circuitry. It generates a sweep signal which is, it comes down on this lead and eventually gets into the horizontal amplifier, which is used to control the uh, uh, gain, if you like, of the uh, horizontal uh, signal, which is going to be a, a ramp to produce a sweep. I think there's also blanking in this scope, I think. So when we go back, I'm going to zoom in on this area here. See a little more of what's going on. So the signal here from the antenna, the antenna signal basically, a bit of it is picked off. It goes through this capacitor, which is quite important. And then it goes through a series of capacitors depending upon where this attenuator switch is set. Now the part that's missing on the schematic is that the attenuator switch is connected directly to the vertical gain control which maybe is not on the uh, this is not visible here the vertical gain control is right here that's a potentiometer I'm doing that there's a rod that runs between this device if you like and that control on the front panel and when you turn the vertical gain, you're not only adjusting the potentiometer I just showed you, you're, you're turning this. This. Interestingly enough, as much as you would think this would be like a snap switch or you would feel this turn, you cannot feel it 
at all. And there's a, there's a comment on it. Somewhere in here, there is a comment that says exactly that. You, you cannot feel, and I'm not spotting it right now, you cannot feel this, this control at all. It certainly works because when I turn the control I can see the display getting larger and smaller. So that after that attenuator the signal is sent right to here, right to the deflector plates. As much as I thought this would be horizontal and these would be vertical, that's not how they've shown them here. They, these are the vertical plates here. These coils are designed to ensure the RF that arrives here can't work its way back this way because if it could, it would enter backwards into the vertical amplifier. Now what's coming out of the vertical amplifier is low frequency so it can pass right through these coils and get here. So that, that's how that's operating. Man, was I confused. Now, I've noticed something else here too. I've been looking for, you know, where is the positive, the high voltage positive feed to the phosphorus basically in the front of this tube. But in fact, what they've done is, instead of making this positive to attract the electrons, they've made all of this highly negative. This makes this a little extra dangerous. Um, if you don't recognize or are not aware that this is what they've done, you could easily be contacting what you suspect are fairly low voltages here when in fact they're like 1400 volts sitting on these terminals. Very dangerous. There's some of the numbers right there. 1400 minus, let me say minus 1210 minus 1400. So hands away, hands away from the back of this tube for sure. That's also probably why it says here do not measure you're in for a surprise because there's probably a very high voltage sitting there 1400 sitting there do not measure okay um, so what this really amounts to then is two scopes in one depending upon how you feed the signal in the back it's an RF scope for monitoring antenna type signals or output from a, from a transmitter um, the range is pretty good. I think it goes. It, it'll function at six meters, I believe. So the range is pretty good on it. Along with this, you know, being an RF scope to do that, it's also an audio scope, and you can put signals in uh, the horizontal or more typically the vertical. Another thing that's a little confusing here is switches like this see that this is, let's pick one here, that there, SW2C, switch number two, section C. Now I'm used to working in old radios, and this would be a separate section, most likely. It'd be a separate wafer on a multi-wafer switch. There's uh, four, four of these, A, B, C, and D. There'd probably be two wafers or maybe four wafers, but not in this radio, or this uh, uh, scope rather, Here's the hint down here. Here's a diagram of switch number two. And it's not a whole bunch of wafers. It's just one rotating switch. And it's just wired, and I guess the terminal arrangement inside here, the moving terminals, contactors or whatever, are such that you get this kind of switch action out here. And there you can see A, B, C, and D. All on one wafer, basically. So that, that's also a little bit on the confusing side. So boy was I ever lost on this until I made these, uh, these observations. So I'm not saying I'm telling you everything about this. I'm not. I'm focused on what I want to do with it since it, it seems to work fine, basically fine. I'd like it to be more sensitive. So what is in the way of the signal that reaches the CRT? So this has some capacitors here. Now here's some that are put in the way by rotating the switch. Here's one that's always in the way. Here's a couple more that are in the way. After that, there's nothing. It's right on to these, the 
deflector plates. So we can just kind of concentrate on this part here. So what could be dragging down the signal? Well, maybe nothing. The scope may be working just as intended. All these capacitors may be just fine. Uh, they all look like highly reliable type of capacitors, mica capacitors or ceramic capacitors. They're not likely to be a problem. But in a world where I want to get this thing more sensitive, these are my only options. Now, if I turn the attenuator up to maximum, it comes right around and contacts this number two spot, all these capacitors are out. So once this is turned up full, these don't matter. What you're left with then is this one and these two. So this one looks like 39 picofarads to me. This is the capacitor I'm going to go after right away. I'm going to take this out, measure it, test it, replace it. Am I going to replace it with a 39? Got to give that a lot of thought before I go ahead and do it. Uh, maybe I'm going to replace it with a bigger capacitor to let more through. That's my thinking. These two could be in trouble too. Um, I have no reason to think they are, but they could be. Maybe again, changing the size of these, which I'm not inclined to do. I'm inclined to fiddle with this one. It's easily accessed. This is this is on the circuit board. It's a little more difficult, but I give that some consideration too. The first thing I'm going to focus on is this one capacitor. We're going to take it out and test it and see what's up. Okay, let's have a look at the machine again. Okay, so vertical control, vertical potentiometers for the low frequency part of the circuit. Big rod, which somehow did not slap me in the face, going all the way back to the RF attenuator. The RF is contained in the box here, for the most part. Capacitor of interest is this guy right here. It's coming straight from the input, straight down to the atten attenuator. If this guy uh, has uh, dropped in capacitance, it's going to be a bit of a roadblock for the signal. And it's probably a bit of a roadblock anyway. So I'm going to remove that guy. And uh, we'll take a look at it. Oddly enough, it's, it uses this little extension here. The uh, leads that come with the capacitor aren't long enough, so this is how they uh, accommodated that. Okay, I'm going to get that out. We're going to test it, see what it says. With just a little wee bit more thought, I decided not to remove it. I'm just going to open this connection, and then we can test the capacitor inside there. And if it turns out to be to be fine, my option is just to reconnect it or to think about reducing it, reducing, uh, putting a different one in with a lower value. Whoa, 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 whoa. ruined the capacitor already doing this. There we are. I don't want to be bending the leads too much like that or tugging on them. That's not so good. Okay, so to test that, I think I'm going to use this handy little guy here. Three picofarads. It's supposed to be 39. Now, 
when things like this read a little high in a capacitor test, it's been my experience that they're a little leaky. So we're gonna we're gonna try to do a leak test on this capacitor. Um, I think I'm halfway to removing it now. Might as well go all the way and take it right out. Is it reading the wrong amount like that? I don't even know what, I, what I'm thinking is I'll put a bigger capacitor in. And look, this one's reading bigger. I think it's a false reading. Okay, turn the solder joint into a cold joint here. Plus or minus 10, 500 volt capacitor. Let's test it again now that it's out. Let's do that. Okay, there's nothing wrong with this capacitor. I guess having it in the circuit there was somehow it had enough stray capacitance around somehow to give a, a higher reading. So, what to do? What to do? Uh, stop for a while, drink some coffee, and think about uh, putting a bigger capacitor in there. I could do something experimentally too. Well, I think there's an important hint here in the schematic. That is really, this capacitor is just another one in the series here. Now, yeah, if you turn everything up full, it's left all alone, 39 all by itself. But what if you snap it to three here? Well, then you've got signal has to pass through an additional 150. Well, it's getting through basically 40. 150 is four or five times the size, four times the size. This can't cause much difference. And we go way down the other end where you're trying to make a fair size difference now. You're, you're adding these in, but in fact you're not really adding them because they're in series. The small values become dominant. So the big ones kind of don't matter once you have a smaller one in. So you can take it all the way down to 0.56. Now why would you do that? Well, because you're using 100 watts on your transmitter, actually up to 1,000, using 1,000 watts. So it's passing through here like nothing, but getting stuck on this little guy at 1,000 watts. Obviously, when I swing this all the way around, I still have 39 sitting here. So if there were a thousand watts coming in here and I had this snapped here, the capacitance of the circuit would be limited by this small value. Maybe, maybe these two combined, you can think of it that way, maybe. So what this is telling me is that I can increase the size of this a long ways. A long, long ways. If it wasn't for this wire, I could get rid of it entirely. If I need, if, if, if I operate the set as I do, with this all the way over here, and all there is is 39, well, I can pick 39 off in here, right there. Oh, well, sort of, 47, 39, 20, yeah, something like that. So this is telling me I can increase the size of this a long ways. Maybe up to 150, maybe even much higher. And then rely on the attenuator and just never ever stick a thousand watts through it, and that's never going to happen. 
The most I would ever transmit is the limit of my transmitter. That's 100 watts. And I could probably still handle it with this if I cared to, just by snapping it down here, even with this being a fair size. Here's the part that's kind of interesting is if you've got you know 40 picofarads here, and you put it in series with 150, um, this is going to become 30 altogether, something of that sort. It's still on the on the run here, easily. I think I could put a very large capacitor in here and get away with it. Put a very large capacitor, maybe maybe a 150 or something in that range. So I'm going to set up for an experiment here. I've got the CB radio still here, a very low power, a couple watts. And I think I'm going to put a big capacitor in here, just temporarily. And then we'll see what this control can do. Now, am I going to wreck anything else? I don't think so, because what you see on the screen and the way you set it causes you to limit the uh, signal level here which is heading off, a little bit's being peeled off, uh, being detected and then shoved over here to create the uh, uh, sweep circuit, the sweep, uh, the sweep signal. So you, you wouldn't want this to go stupidly high or this is going to go high and maybe something bad's going to happen down this way. I don't see any particular protection in here. Unlike some of these other circuits which have got a lot of protection on them, like, like this stuff here, these things here. Risk is very low because I'm only doing using two watts of power during the experiment. So I, I don't think I'm running any risk here at all, actually. So I'm going to get a big fat um, at, at least a 150 and stick it in there, and we'll see what happens. Okay, there's the new guy in there. I got bold and I put in a really big one, 330, because I have a lot of these. I gotta use them up, so I'm gonna use it there. I still think I'm gonna be able to easily restrict the power uh, way, way down with the uh, attenuator control, which I'm now going to turn down right, right now. Okay, I'm gonna set this up with the uh, oh so powerful CB radio, and we'll see what happens. Okay, there. Now there is one thing I haven't mentioned about this, uh, which you know, if you have one of these, you should know this. That if you drive a signal larger than the graticule, beyond the graticule, that signal is too strong for some components in this machine and it will uh, damage them. So it's very important to keep the signal level at the screen below, below the limits of the screen on, on this guy. And that's one of the reasons I've been so kind of cautious about uh, doing what I'm doing. But uh, great. Okay, here we go. Turn this on. And I don't think it's plugged in, so I'm going to plug it in. I found from experience things work better when they're when they're plugged in. Okay, there we go. Set the single sideband. Vertical gain is minimum. Sweep is set on the high speed. That matters. Have a nice straight display. Let me turn it down a little bit because it's bright in the camera. There we are. Nice straight line there. Turn on the oh so powerful CD radio. Okay, let's listen. Boy, if I heard a voice come out of there, I would just freak right out. <laughs> okay, got the power meter here. Set the power. So this is going to go about straight up. That'd be two watts. Here we go. Okay, it's showing. No, it's showing four watts on here. I'm seeing nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So now we'll start turning this up. go. You can see it clicking in the capacitors. That's the top. 
Wow, that's not bad. If this is what 4 watts will do, that's good. That's excellent. Because 10 watts is going to fill the screen and I can restrict it. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, so this whole journey was well worth it. Great. So that's going to be the end of the video. Um, I'm just going to put it back together and put it back in its spot. And I have another small project I'm going to work on probably today, which I may, I may make a video of it. Okay, fantastic. So thanks a lot for watching, and uh, the radio is coming soon. <laughs>